Hello everyone and welcome. This is one of the last webinars of the year that you are able to see. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, a few items from me before we get started. Number one, the entire session is recorded. So if you did miss out an answer to a question or you had to step away when there was a particular slide or you want to share this presentation with your team, fear not. Um, we will send the entire recording along with any resources that we share, whether it's on the webinar itself or in the Q&A at the end. We'll put all that in the follow-up email, which you should receive uh, later today or tomorrow. Secondly, um, if you do have questions throughout the session, uh, whilst chat is enabled, please do use the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. It just puts the questions in a nice, uh, neat order for us to get to, and we, it ensures we don't miss any out, you know, if we have to scroll through chat or anything like that. So uh, a quick move on for our agenda today. So um, we're going to kick off with uh, concurrency. We're going to jump into the, the loop and reduce aspects of that. And we have an awesome demo there for you. Uh, and then we're also going to jump into some click cloud info, uh, some updates, and obviously the bit that everybody loves, some performance related tips and tricks uh, in regards to collaboration. And then also we'll have uh, plenty of time at the end for Q&A. So I think that is it from me to write at this moment in time. I'll certainly circle back at the end. Um, but yeah, I think it is time to introduce those uh, hosts we have on the call today. So I think if we start with yourself, Carl, if you'd like to introduce yourself and then pass on. Yes. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Carl, uh, and I'm a product manager for collaboration. And uh, maybe Darmishta wants to go next. Uh, thank you, Carl. I'm Darmishta. I'm the senior implementation consultant here at Vislib. And uh, maybe I'll now pass on to Martin. Uh, hello everyone, Martin, um, product manager for Vislib, um, looking over things like performance and various other topics around that, including live and whatnot. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Michael. Yeah, hi everyone, uh, Michael Nordstrom. Um, some of you have hopefully met me before. I am the head of Click Products at Vislib, so I'm responsible for all of these lovely products. Awesome stuff. Thank you very much all. And I think first on the agenda today is you, Darmishta. So if you'd like to take it away, we can jump straight into it. Absolutely. Thank you there, Jason. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm Darmishta and thank you today for joining. I'm going to share with you loop and reduce tasks. So before I share my screen, to give you the heads up, this demo is mainly based on configuring the back end. And this is an important part. Once you understand that, then the front will be much more simpler to implement. And loop and reduce tasks can be used to deliver several benefits. And as a summary, it will allow for concurrent users. So it allows for several processes to execute at the same time. It creates smaller apps based on loop values with only data that users have access to. And this is defined by the security rules. Smaller applications have a quicker response and reload times, and it's an automated and dynamic process. So let me share my screen and show you more. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen there. Um, and all I've done is opened up this article here, which takes you through an example of how to create and execute loop and reduce tasks. Um, and you know we will be sharing this documentation with you after the call. So don't worry about the detail right now. Um, I'm gonna go through some of these graphics here. So let's go through uh, this first one here. So executing loop and reduce tasks, loop values are in red, green, and blue. Here, the colors um, represent the root loop values, which have been split into the three separate apps. Deploying changes. So note how the version number changes here in the reduced apps based on the updated source app. So you can see that we start with version one in the reduced apps, and then they change to version two. So whatever changes you make in the master app will be reflected in the child apps. The third infographic here, um, it relates to nightly reloads. And uh, yes, they can be reloaded more frequently, but nightly reloads is the most common use case. So this is showing an example of that. 
So it's uh, basically a quick binary update of the larger data volumes, and then typically smaller data from each write back is added. One thing to remember is that, um, you know, if you did more frequent reloads, uh, that scheduled reloads can interfere with write back. And it's not recommended to do that when users are doing that, you know, performing that write back process. And then we have the final image here. So this shows reload after write back and we're focusing on the green QVD, uh, which takes data from the binary app and uh, from any write backs performed. So just giving you some different scenarios there. And I'm gonna scroll right to the bottom of the documentation. Um, and before you start, there are a few things that you'll need to complete. So in the QMC, you need access to this. So make sure that's uh, enabled with permissions to upload apps and create and edit custom properties. And in the VMC, you need access to this with permissions to create and edit security rules. And then you have the option here to uh, download and import uh, these applications to your QMC. So a little bit of background, we've got the binary app here, and this contains the data for the example, and then the concurrency demo app performs a binary reload from the above app. So this is the master one. And then you have the Excel file, which contains the loop values. So this is good to use if you have many loop values. In our case, we only have three. So we're looking at three uh, cost, cost uh, centers, 100, 200, and 300. So um, we can copy and paste them in into the VMC later. So let's go to the QMC and streams. Um, and then you'll notice here that you need to create two streams. We've got the concurrency binary dev uh, and the concurrency user stream. Um, and as I mentioned here, the concurrency binary dev, the two downloaded apps should be published here. And then this is where the users one, this is where our reduced user end apps will be created. In the security rules section, I wanted to show you screen. Uh, so firstly, we would need to change this default security rule that sits under this stream. So let's edit that. Um, and you can see here under this advanced section, <clears throat> um, it's basically saying that if you have access to a stream, then you also have access to all the apps that fall in that stream. So that's why we have modified it with this extra condition here. And this is in relation to the loop and reduce to exclude certain streams from this rule. And what it's saying is where the stream name is not equal to concurrency users, we need to exclude that. So this is the change that you need to make to this stream security rule. Another change will be under the custom properties. So you need to add uh, here, uh, you need to add your loop values and assign users. So let's take a look. You can see we've assigned the users. We've got our loop values here at the bottom. And um, this here is the username the, of the attribute, so user attribute name. Um, and the, it will determine you know, access to the app. So in your example, it may be department or teams or groups or whatever that may be. And the attribute value must be equal to the loop value. Okay. Um, now we're gonna move on to creating a task in the VMC. So we have this special section here, loop and reduce task. And you would just uh, tick on this button, select that, and follow the settings in the documentation. I have already created one here. And so you can see the task name is collaborative forecast. And then we have uh, two additional uh, settings here. So app name is concurrency demo. And um, this will be the master app name. And then this is for the stream, which is concurrency users. So all our child apps will sit under there. And then scrolling down, you can see our loop values. So I've already pasted them in. And if we needed to add more, we can very quickly do that like this. Um, and obviously if you had uh, say 50 of them, you could just paste them in from your Excel file. Okay, so that's your um, loop values. 
Next, let's select uh, the security rules wizard. So something to note, it's important, um, modifying security rules can grant users permission and access to data which they should not have. So always remember to verify any changes here. So let's select the user attribute, which is concurrency cross center here. Um, and you can see that the security rules have been populated. So here in the VMC, we can see our configured and modified security rules, which will grant access to those reduced apps. So the left rule is applied to the application and the right one should look familiar because it's our edited rule for the screen. So what we do is copy this and go to security rules. And there it is. So concurrency app access, that's the name of our security rule. You'd edit that and um, you can see here that we, we would just paste it in. And you, these um, conditions are specific for those loop values. So that can be picked up. So now we have all our security rules set up correctly. We can move on to executing tasks in the VMC. So we have our task already created. And the way that would work, you can see these three dots here, you would select on execute task, but I've recently done that. And I'm gonna show you an example in just a little while anyway. Um, but then you can see when I float on this successful, uh, three apps have been deployed in concurrency users. So what I'm gonna do is show you that in the hub. And just a bit of background here. So we've got our two streams um, and the binary dev, the two downloaded apps should be published in here and then concurrency users, because we execute tasks, we would then see our child apps being produced. Uh, so they've got the cost centers there with 100, 200, 300. So that's the, the you know, displayed as the suffix after the loop and reduce task has executed successfully. So the main power of loop and reduce here is when you make a change to the apps that users use, you only need to do this once, and that would be in the master app. And then those, those um, changes would be reflected in your uh, child apps. So let's do that. What we would do is take a duplicate of your master app, which I have here. And whether you'd make a, a change at sheet level, you know, you delete a sheet or you make a visualization change, or even a change to say a title, which I'll do in this example. So all we're doing is adding the word test here at the end, and we'll save that. And then we would republish, place existing and republish. And just refresh the app list. And now that, that change won't be reflected here yet because we would need to execute tasks. And that means that each one of these sheets, whether you had three or 50, all of them would be updated with that first sheet having that word test at the end of its title. So let's go uh, back to the VMC. And this time we're actually going to execute those tasks. So you click on that. And just while that's one, you can see it's executing one of three. So Jason, I'll just ask you, any questions come through there? Yes, we do have a number of questions. Number one, uh, documentation suggests use of binary loop reload with loop and reduce tasks. Should partial reload ever be used or will it not work with loop and reduce? So partial reload can be used, but it's harder to develop and debug if it's not working. So we recommend binary loads. Um, you can see on our documentation, they are super quick, they're easy to debug, and they're better supported as well. And we also can share with you an article which shows a short comparison of both. So we'll do that. Good stuff, good stuff. Do we have time for another, or is this yeah, ready we, to go? Yeah, we could do another one, still executing there. Awesome. Um, this is one from chat. Uh, does this work with analyzer capacity users too, um, or does the user have to have a professional license for creating a reduced app? So because we are writing, uh, you know, and using the server, 
um, you can add extra security to your applications. And it doesn't matter what type of license you have, whether it's professional or analyzer, because the security is enabled um, and you can have read and write only access available by applying security rules. So yeah, it's not license dependent there at all. Awesome. Okay, so you can see this has been executed successfully and three apps have been deployed in concurrency users. So let's take a look at those. So we can open any of those and we'll just check that that word test has been added at the end of the first sheet. And there we go. So yeah, you can see the power there. Like I said, I've done a very simple change, but you could have done multiple changes and you wouldn't have to do that to every single app in your uh, hub. So that's really powerful. Um, next, we're gonna move on to data, data load scripts and data connections. So I'm just gonna open the master app. And it opens uh, on the section with a binary load right at the top there. Um, and remember, every time you perform a write back operation, a reload operation is also required. So binary loads will speed up and reload, um, you know, that reload and improve the performance. So, yeah, good to know. Here we go. Um, so, yeah, that's just the one line of code. Uh, and what we're doing here is basically a data connection. And the data connection is concurrency binary. So if this connection doesn't exist, uh, in our example, you can see it does. So if it doesn't, then you would need to create this. Um, and then also have a look under the README section of the application. So we need to uh, set up this data connection concurrency data. Um, and that will be where the, where the master app will store and load its data. So QVD files folders will be created on reload of those demo apps. And note, if you want to set up, you know, different data connections, just refer to this section in both those applications. And you can check your data connections in the QMC as well. So what we'll do now is move on to the VMC and create a write back destination. So it's here. And you would add a destination and configure it. But in my case, we have one already. Um, follow the documentation in terms of you know what these settings mean and but it's quite straightforward as well for example the operation uh, that the write back is using the type of destination whether you're reloading the full app or a partial reload and then you can use tags as well which i'll come to but i want to move very quickly to this whitelist so phone, uh, the file name picker can be used in the front end to select one of the names from this list. And that makes it possible for all the tables in the application to um, use that same write back destination. So it makes it dynamic when used with the tags. And since we're mentioning tags, I can show you here, just gonna move to insert as well because there's more um, settings available there. But anyway, you can see here that the subfolder um, is, is a tag that you can use. Uh, here we go. And you can also use um, by, by user. So you can change the user here so that each user gets their own subfolder to save their file to. And it creates a, a nice file structure. Another popular one to use is timestamp. Um, and this works well with the insert. It creates a timestamp for when the write back is done and will be written back to its own subfolder. So it's um, some good tips there. Uh, and then finally, we'll move on to this uh, locking mechanisms. So when you select insert, you've got this Q mode that can be uh, enabled. Um, and the way this works is when you use a destination, you will be able to write back, but if there's already a write back in process, it becomes queued. And then the reload is postponed until all the write backs in that queue have completed. And only then you can do the app reload. And the benefit of queue is that a status message will show in the write back, you know, whether the user is number one or two in the queue. So it really does enhance that user experience. And it's a, a popular method used by uh, many large organizations when used with insert. 
Some of the other things to help with concurrency are auto lock. So when somebody um, is doing a write back, other users cannot click on that write back button. It becomes disabled until the write back process and reload is complete. And then allow manual lock in as well. You can see there on the description there, uh, allows to lock given write back destination so that only one user can write back to it at a time. But the most popular one um, and our, one of our latest features is the row locking. Um, and myself, Carl and the team will give you some examples of row locking um, in, in a demo a little bit later. So um, let's have a look at some other things here. This secure destination, this is a powerful thing. So when I tick on this button, it means that we're going to apply a security rule for this destination. So we can just apply the security from here. And this is a quick example. So create something like this. And this is where the read and write access can be enabled as well. So when the active uh, toggle switch is on, that means anybody under this uh, security rule will be able to read and write. But you can very quickly disable that. And that means that this uh, user will only have reader only access. And the benefit here is that they don't consume a license. So you may, you know, that's something to consider there. Your, your attribute types here, um, these are inherited from the QMC. So things like uh, your users, your roles and your custom properties. So they're available there, which makes, you know, building up the security rules a lot more efficient. You can even have AD groups there. Um, and this resource ID, this is the one that would need to be used in the front end extension. Okay, so just touching on security. And then I will just move back onto this documentation and just something to bear in mind there. So if you want to use a destination with a different ID, you need to update this BizLib server destination, the variable in the README section of the, this app here. So you can see it. Um, so something to be aware of. And then finally, let me show you app access control. So that can be configured here under users. So I actually am a content admin, so I have access to everything. Uh, so I won't be able to um, show you this live, but just something that you need to change. So uh, under cost center, a concurrency cost center custom property, I have access to all three apps, but you would just select depending on the, the user role. And if I select 200 there, then that means that person would only have access to that particular app. Um, so one thing I haven't been able to cover in this demo is where the code for the reduction and filtering takes place. Um, but the three main sections to look at are the subfilter data on group here, uh, set group variable, and the loop and reduce sections. And we do have the details with images in the documentation, which we can share with you. And as a final note, in the VMC, um, Remember serverless, you have no concurrency method at all for the reload, it will show a failure. So we encourage using the VizLib server, plus you have ad, you know, extra added security and being able to add you know, integrations to your applications as well. And you can make the most out of the free extension, its extension and the collaboration product, which is the write back table, input form and teamwork. So that's it from me. I'll now hand you over to Carl, who can show you a little, you know, demo of the collaborative forecast app um, and some of the other latest features. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamishta. It was very informative. Thank you. Uh, Just stop sharing. So, so hopefully many of you are uh, curious about this uh, collaborative forecast application that Darmishta uh, showed, how, how to divide that up uh, for different users to have their own application. So uh, I will go over this and show you what we have created. Uh, write back table and the input form are very powerful and uh, generic uh, uh, extensions that you can utilize to uh, whatever processes you have and customize it in ways that you can only imagine. And this is uh, showcasing one example of that. And uh, this is trying to uh, replace uh, more expensive forecasting tools where uh, you can define the logic in your load script and then 
create a process with a uh, approval process to to create forecast. And later I will also uh, follow up on how uh, you will uh, uh, can work with the uh, forecast uh, after it's been created as well. So let's dig in. Uh, here we have a uh, way of creating forecasts based on the history of the data. Uh, so in this is a very simple one where we have a uh, forecast for revenue, cost of goods sold, and operational cost. So what I can do is based on the last year's values, I can adjust it. So maybe we want a little bit more of revenue, uh, slight less cost of goods sold, and trying to reduce the operational cost slightly. I can also add individual uh, adjustments. I can change the distribution of these. And I can also make uh, the, the, the forecast for each row based on the uh, actuals or not based on the actuals. So I will remove this. So with only these four uh, inputs, I'm able to generate something uh, that will be the base of my forecast. So if I do a right back here and do an uh, export, uh, the business logic on how this is applied is done in the load script. So now the load script have done, uh, been uh, executed, and it has generated a forecast for me. So if I make a selection here, I will see it here. So we increase the revenues, reduce the cost of goods sold, and then we put the operational cost more flat than previously. So some big levers to uh, push, but then if you want to go into more details, uh, you're able to do that by going into the individual rows uh, and change the values individually. So maybe we know we're gonna do a big campaign here in May. So I will increase uh, these values slightly and I can do a write back and see in the charts above if this is uh, what I was looking for. Uh, yeah, uh, oh, it, I sh accidentally changed the operational cost, but uh, let's go and uh, say we're, uh, okay with this and send it off for review. So if I do that, uh, it's not work in progress. So I will not be able to edit it anymore at this moment. So I don't have anyone uh, in work in progress. So if I go to the next sheet here, uh, I can role play as a different user. Now I'm Joe and I'm a forecaster for cost under 200. Uh, instead, if I change to uh, an approver of those cost centers, and Sarah here is also approver for 300. So if I change that role and do right back and update, uh, you see that this table changed. Uh, so Joe had his uh, forecast that he had uh, created, but Sarah sees all the ones that uh, are uh, available for her to review. Uh, so this one is the one that we uh, created earlier and she can take a look at it. She can select it and, and do a comparison uh, how, it, how it's already. So I, she can see it here up in the shards. She can change and check how it looks like uh, compared to others. And if she's happy with it, she can improve it or she can send it back to Joe for him to do another round of changes. And she can also type comments for him uh, while doing that. And we also incorporate the teamwork, which is our uh, chat client that using real-time data. The benefit of this is that I uh, can then reach out and mention, for example, the Mishta that uh, a new forecast is ready for her to take a look at. And then she will be notified uh, on this bell here. She will see that she has a new notification and we will also send her an email with uh, the comment with the link to, uh, to, for her to get back to this and see exactly where uh, she needs to uh, take action. So, now we've covered the process of how you could use the write back table to, uh, to create the forecast. So 
uh, when you have the forecast and you start to get into uh, the months uh, that you have forecasted for, uh, you usually start commenting on um, uh, on the deviations from the forecast. So we can see here that these, this row is, oh, it's uh, the cost for support agreements has gone up very much. And as you can see now, uh, Dermishta and Martin and Michael is uh, have started to edit the same uh, table here, but we can still interact at the same time. So Michael uh, locked this row uh, because he started to edit this. And this row I have locked when I started to edit it, so it's not available for them. And as you saw, Michael did his changes and now I've done a write back. So his changes is already there. So uh, I will add a new comment here and do a write back. So it can be very collaborative, uh, the write back table, uh, when setting up these processes. And the benefit of this uh, is, since we're using insert, we, we get the queuing mechanisms that we saw. Uh, we also get the benefit of having all the uh, history of each row in the table as well. So if you look at this badge here, it's a four. And that is because it has four interactions previously. So if we take a look, we can see all the comment history and we see the type of comment and we can see that it has been approved by me earlier, three months ago. And Martin Mahler here uh, went in and put in a comment six months ago. So you, you get the full history of what happened on this. So this makes it very powerful. Uh, let's go back to some other updates that we have. Uh, we have worked closely with uh, Click uh, on improving uh, reloads in Click Cloud. Uh, and we changed the APIs that we're using. So now, when using the write back in Click Cloud, you will not uh, be queued anymore uh, for other people who are doing the right uh, reloads on the same tenant. So that is a huge improvement because those queues could take up to minutes and you don't, when doing a write back, you don't want to wait that long. Uh, Click has also added more uh, pods to the reload, so more machines in the cloud. So uh, if you're doing an app automation and doing a reload inside of there, you you don't have access to the same APIs that we now use. Uh, so it's still a possibility that it can be queued, but since Click had improve uh, the reload pods, uh, the queuing uh, will be a lot uh, shorter, which is really nice. Uh, another thing uh, is that Click Cloud doesn't allow you to have the same options uh, to get uh, user attributes. So you don't have the option that uh, Dermista showcased earlier that you can create a custom property on the user and then apply it to different ones. Uh, so Click Cloud is very limited on that. So, and that since you don't have many user attributes in the Click Cloud, it becomes a problem when you want to base access off of that. So one thing that we added in the VMC is now that you can grant uh, access to uh, resources by using a space access in Click Cloud. So you see it here, it's space access, and you pick the space uh, that the access should be uh, checked on, and you also can uh, define what type of uh, uh, role or access the user needs to have to be able to get this access. So I configure it with the write back destination, which is called Vislib write back demo data. And I'm granting write access to everyone who has space access to Vislib write back demo data space and are able to uh, view it. I could also change it. So I could do, oh, I will give the owners access to VMC admin. So I, the owners of this space will now be able to edit this destination here in VMC. So you uh, can now see how we're leveraging the space access 
to also include security rules uh, for the Vislib server resources. Uh, another thing is uh, the latest release also came with a huge performance fix. So we had uh, a bug uh, that was affecting ver from version 4.10 when we introduced the autocomplete. So if you have uh, used right back table and added or removed uh, columns in a table uh, with version between 4.10 and 4.13.2, then uh, your table needs to be updated. So what you do is you upgrade the extension to the latest version, and then you go in and edit the table and add a column and then remove the column. And that should fix it, and you will see a huge performance uh, improvement. So the next thing, it's something I'm really excited by, and it's uh, we're, we're going to give you a sneak peek here uh, from something that is coming uh, pretty soon. Uh, it's been developed by my favorite development team, the Kittens, and uh, they produce really high quality work. Uh, so this is almost production ready. So uh, I think it will be re released pretty soon. So let's uh, take a look what the VisTips uh, 2.0 has in store. Uh, so uh, for you who are not familiar with VisTip is that you can show uh, in a uh, VisLip extension, you can show another uh, object in there as a tooltip. But it requires some set analysis and some variables to be defined. And it's you can only use one VisTip for, uh, for each object. Uh, but with this one, uh, you don't have to use any set analysis. You don't have to set up any variables. You just create the object and define which uh, uh, columns should be used for selections uh, to reduce, uh, uh, to, to display uh, the correct data for that particular thing that you're hovering over. So here you can see I have a simple KPI uh, which showing what team Radek is uh, working on and what type of task is do, uh, working on as well. And I have a different one here uh, for uh, uh, the the team, and we can see the different persons who uh, belongs to that team uh, in this chart. And as you can see, I can also interact with this chart, so I, I can actually hover and see more detail on this. Uh, and we also introduce uh, that you can pop up uh, a tooltip as well. So when I click on this one, it opens up a different one. Uh, so I think this will uh, be very uh, powerful, but it's more than just adding different uh, visualization to different columns. So if I take this to the next level, for example, in, in this one, I set it up with uh, input form. So I can, from the table, use another input write back table or input form and start doing a new task here. So if I do this and submit, it will generate a new task and it will be shown in the table. If I go through it, oh, it was there. So here you see it. Uh, but maybe you think, is this just for the collaboration products? But no, we plan to implement this in, in all of our uh, extensions. So in, in the first release, we'll include it in the Gaunt. Uh, so the same thing as in write back table, but in here, I think it becomes even more powerful. Because for example, in, in the face of alpha, I can now show how many tasks, how many people are working on those tasks, and how many teams uh, are, are those people in. And if I go to the next uh, thing here, uh, I can see the people who are working in the development phase of this one. And if I go to the team level, I have this pop-up here. 
So I can go in and get the right back table and look at this here. I have the visdip.2 task. And if I change this to a different date, change it to the 17, and do a right back. The amazing thing here is that the Gantt chart now becomes uh, editable with the right back. So I changed it to the 17 and it's directly uh, reflected in, in the Gantt uh, chart directly. And another really cool thing is that when we implement this into all our other extensions, you can now start to have conversations with the data. So we see this as a very common use case with right back where you, as I showed in that finance annotation application where you have a conversation with other people. So this brings instant annotations to every data you have, every data point. And this is utilizing the tiles uh, extension. So I'm showing this in a familiar commentary uh, format style here. And I can add a new one here. And it will do the right back. And this is now associated with the VisTip 2.0 task. So I think this uh, will give all our users who are using the VisLib products uh, some new capabilities that are amazing. Uh, so if we go back and summarize what we do, uh, so we're going to remove all the complicated set analysis and variables. Uh, we're going to allow for multiple VisTips per object. So for example, you can have different VisTip in a different column in a finance report. Uh, that is a very much requested feature. Uh, you can now do pop-ups. So you can pop up uh, the table, no, no worrying of your hovering uh, uh, like hides the pop-up. Now you can click on it and you have to close it uh, for it to go away. And right back enabled, as I showed, uh, this gives you the opportunity to annotate. You can edit data directly into the chart, or even you can add it to a pivot table. Uh, and that this will unlock so many things. So easy add annotation to any chart. And this is what we will have. So that was all I had to share. So over to you, uh, Jason. Good stuff, good stuff. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you very much, Domishta. And now we can crack on with all of the great questions. So I think we've got a, a good question to kick off in the chat. Um, when will the new version of Tooltips be available? So VisTip 2.0, when is that coming? When it's ready. <laughs> Standard product market product manager answer. I like it. It's not. Like it's it. not going to be that long, though. Uh, we're looking at either late this year or in January next year, uh, depending on how far into Christmas the developers want to work. Um, so no, but as you can see, it it's it works already. So we have a really good state of that and good prototype. <clears throat> we're hoping to release it, but yeah, we won't release it until it it's ready. But this is super promising and we've mentioned this a little bit before but you probably haven't seen um, demos this complete before so hopefully this was another another step um and sort of helping you understand what all the amazing things that we will be able to do with this good stuff good stuff thank you very much for that um a question i think this can go to anyone uh maybe domish because you mentioned it first <laughs> what does vmc stand for <laughs> Okay, that's BizLib Management Console. A good way to remember that is the QMC is the Click, Click Management Console. So VMC is BizLib. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. And I think this will also be for you, Domishta. Um, is Loop and Reduce available for ClickSense Enterprise in Windows? And is it also available for ClickSAS or ClickCloud? Or I guess the question is, which versions is, is, is it available in? Yeah, so available for enterprise, yes, but it's not supported in Click Cloud. I'm not exactly sure about the detail here, but presuming it's not as simple to implement, you know, in in relation to the enterprise version. Um, but yeah, something maybe they could send in a feature request and we can try and include it in a different way. Uh, 
I, I can elaborate a little bit on that. In 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 the Click Cloud, there is actually loop and reduce as an app automation feature. So it's all like it's not the thing that uh, this loop server support, but similar functionality exists there. So it doesn't exist on the on premise. Uh, so that's why we uh, developed it for the on premise. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you, thank you. Uh, next question from Adrian here. The approval functionality of this app is awesome, but do you have an example app for non-approval process-based forecasting? We don't have an example, but uh, I think it would be very easy just to modify the, mm -hmm. the application we have and just remove that step. So it, it's just data, uh, so and you can control that. So I think if you dig into the load script there, you you will probably find it fairly easy. It's uh, commented, and if you follow the flow there, you can modify it to your needs that you have in your uh, business. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, is it possible to define which users can open the vis tip? We haven't that as a requirement, but it's something that we could add. So please send in a feature request and we will take a look at it. Cool, awesome stuff. Um, is there a way to force saving table to the server without the user pressing write back data? Um, not at the moment. Cool. And again, if that's really important to you, make a feature request, I, I think is the, the good point for that. Um, so yeah, we have a, a few more minutes for questions. So if you do have any burning questions, please get them in uh, using the Q&A function. Um, just rolling through a couple of questions here in chat. Um, when using VizTip 2.0, will previously built tooltips work or will they need to be rebuilt? So we're looking at that and we, don't see a super easy transformation path from the old ones since they were rather complex. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, creating the new ones will be super simple. Um, so you could simply, it's more about sort of removing things from your expressions to make it work with the new version. So the working theory right now is that we'll have Wistips 2.0 or whatever it will be called um, as an alternative to Wistip. So it won't be like something that is a migratable path um if we figure out something smart on how to do that we'll obviously do it but for now it's going to be one more feature uh because it's so much simpler i don't think that's going to be a problem hopefully the old one will still work by the way so we won't break the old one yeah i think that's a, a good thing to know for everyone on the call and I think that is the end of our questions. So what I will do is say the whole session, as I said at the beginning, the whole session is recorded um, along with all the resources we mentioned or linked or showed. Um, however, if for whatever reason you have a, you're, you're sitting there having a glass of wine tonight and you suddenly a question pops into your head, when you receive that follow-up email, you can just reply to us and we'll get straight back to you there. So never fear that your questions will go unanswered. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to the the brain trust, I think we can call it today on today's call. So uh, particularly Domishta and Carl, thank you very much for everything that you shared and showed today. And also again, thank you to Michael. Thank you to Martin for this webinar and all the previous ones so far this year. So thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to the trust and see you all on the next one. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye. -bye. Cheers. Bye.